Those of us who are statin hesitant are faced with a dilemma. The mainstream medical profession has all the political clout and the credentials to label us as anti-science, deniers, or in one case, a death cult. So that puts us in a position of needing to play by the rules in a game with a deck that's stacked against us. So let's look at that. Stay tuned. I'm going to start with a little historical vignette here. In 155 BC, Rome was a rising power in the Mediterranean and a delegation of Greek philosophers went to Rome for some negotiations. And during that visit, they demonstrated the strength and value of using rhetoric by arguing persuasively one day that justice was good and achievable, and the next day, they argued exactly the opposite, justice persuasively. The Romans weren't impressed. They were actually rather infuriated at this. The statesman Cato in particular was incensed. To the Romans, this showed that the Greeks were untrustworthy. You never knew whether they were telling you the truth or not. In their minds, it was a matter of seeking truth versus winning at all costs. And we live with this legacy today, and political discourse in the U.S. anyway. It's not about finding truth. It's about winning the hearts and minds of the voters. In a criminal trial, if a lawyer has an innocent client, he'll take the Roman approach and try exposing the truth to the jury. But if his client is not innocent, he'll go the rhetorical route and try winning the argument without letting the jury know that that's what he's actually doing. So similarly, if we're arguing about statins, we should be seeking the truth, even when the mainstream medicine holds all the cards in this stacked deck. If we go the rhetorical route with good sounding but unsound arguments, we leave our position vulnerable because the other side has the time and the resources to dissect anything and everything we say. And that's what we need to avoid, blunders in our reasoning that provides them with ammunition. One of the mistakes that I see us making and early on that when I was being less careful that includes me is using statistics in the wrong context. So here's a classic one. I often see comments from people saying, well, the absolute risk reduction for the use of statins is only one, some low number, usually 1%, 2%, something like that. And this chart here should look familiar to you. This is a representation of something that David Diamond shows quite often, and it is from a Lepitor trial, and I've just labeled it the event-free survival. The green bar is the number of people who, at the end of this trial, when the trial was stopped, did not have a heart attack. And the red bar is those people who were not being treated, in other words, getting a placebo, who also did not have a heart attack. And you see there is a tiny difference there. It's about 1%. Now this is based on this famous Lipitor ad where the point that Dr. Diamond was making was how the Lipitor ad said it was a 36% difference. That's a relative risk reduction, but because the numbers are so low, the actual risk reduction is 1.1% as it turns out. There's a problem with this. And that should be fairly apparent as soon as you look at the red bar and notice that very few people had heart attacks. So the population we're talking about, the trial we're talking about, there were relatively few events, 3%. It says right here in the ad, 3% of the control group had heart attacks. So it wasn't 50%, it wasn't 40%, it was just 3%. So the absolute risk reduction, even if the medication were perfect, couldn't possibly exceed 3%. So already there are limitations in this group. For example, let's think about it. Well, suppose the trial continued on long enough for 40% of the people to have heart attacks, or it was a different group of higher risk people who had heart attacks, 40% of them had heart attacks. Using this same relative risk reduction, well, the absolute risk reduction wouldn't be 1%, it would be 14.5%. Now, is that figure correct? I don't know because this is an extrapolation. I would be extrapolating from the smaller number of heart attacks to a much larger number of heart attacks in the control group, and I don't know if that's valid. It's definitely not valid to just say the absolute risk reduction given by statins is 1% because here's a case where it might not be. We'll never find out. It would be nice if we could actually find out what the relative risk reduction is at the various different risk levels. And if the pharmaceutical companies have figured it out, it's not in their best interest to tell us that because they keep the data secret. 
and apparently it would tell us something they don't want us to know. Nevertheless, the context we have to understand here is that patients with a 3% risk of having a heart attack over four years saw a 1.1% absolute risk reduction in heart attacks. That is the context from this study that this 1% value is derived from. If we go well beyond the scope of that, we could probably extend it a little. If we apply this well beyond the scope of what the trial was studying, we're actually using this data out of context. That 1% absolute risk reduction is only applicable for this small group with a small percentage of heart attacks in the control group. Another case where we use statistics in the wrong context comes from a study that purported to show that the average life extension from people who were taking statins for many years was only a few days. Now, I covered this in a video which as of the time of this recording, I have not released yet, so I don't know what kind of reception it's going to get, but I challenged the calculation in the first place in that I believe the calculation has a mathematical mistake in it and that for people who were at high risk in secondary prevention, statins did extend their lives by a somewhat meaningful amount. Now that's one of those things that is really an opinion. Was it meaningful? Was it not? Are my numbers correct? Are my numbers incorrect? That's still to be determined. But there's one thing I am certain about is that we still use this four day figure or whatever it is in the wrong context because of this. What about the 89% of the patients who had not died. In this particular example, this is the one that I went through in detail, only 11% of the people had died and we calculated how much life extension those 11% got. The other 89% are still going. So the context problem here is, all we can say is patients with a limited remaining lifespan gain only X more days of life and, and we can argue about what the X is. I argue that it's at least several months. The original article said it's just a few days. We can argue about the math there, but the point is, it's patients with a limited remaining lifespan that these numbers apply to. We don't know what they are for the other 89% of the people. Maybe these two curves here come together. I mentioned that in the other video. Maybe they continue to diverge. If they continue to diverge, then for this group of patients, it would be of substantial benefit statistically for them to take these statins, assuming that the underlying data is correct. And the problem with that, of course, is we're never allowed to see the underlying data. And that's a topic of another video. Another mistake we make is applying population statistics to individuals. Here is a graph that I've shown many times. It's from a study of 14 million Koreans. This is people aged 65 to 74, and I think that was 1.2 million of them. Either this graph or the one of the population as a whole is shown by a lot of YouTubers who want to make the point that cholesterol all-cause mortality is at its best with values around 220 milligrams per deciliter or about 5.7 millimoles per liter. Okay, that's where all-cause mortality is optimal. But does this mean that everyone or even anyone should make that level their target? Well, like I've said, if your level is naturally at 170 and you're healthy, there's no reason to try increasing it. Your body's doing what it wants to do, what it needs to do. For example, in my case, when I'm on a low carb, high fat diet and doing my regular exercise, my total cholesterols are actually creep up towards 300, usually under 300, occasionally go over. If I go on an extended backpacking trip, within a week or two, my values are down closer to 200, and if I stay out there longer than that, they will get well under 200. That's just natural. That's my body's reaction, and that's how my body uses cholesterol, and that's how much we see in my bloodstream. So if we were to apply this population statistic to each individual and say, you should be trying to get to 220 or 240, whatever it turns out to be, I think that's a misapplication of the statistic. Nothing else is known about the characteristics of these patients or their lipid profiles. This is a general population. This is sick people. This is relatively healthy people. This is people who are maybe lean mass hyper responders mixed in with people who have oxidized LDL pattern B LDL versus pattern A LDL, people with terrible triglycerides to HDL ratios, they're all mixed in there. This kind of generic statistic is meaningless in that context. It's like BMI. If you were to calculate the BMI for American tight end football players, they would all be obese. It's not really 
possible for a tight end to be obese. They're, they're just too muscular in order to do their job. They're going to be very muscular athletes. Yet the BMI would say they're obese when they're not. So there's where these kind of population sorts of statistics and calculations don't necessarily apply to individuals. Another mistake we make is reading too much into the number needed to treat. So let's look at this statement. Treatment X results in 4%, that's an absolute risk reduction, fewer bad outcomes than treatment Y. That's what number needed to treat is actually supposed to be doing. It's comparing one treatment versus another. Quite often the other treatment, the Y in this case, is either placebo or nothing, but it could be another drug and we're trying to compare the efficacy of one drug versus another. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about heart attacks, we're talking about hangnails, whatever it is, there is a treatment and it's giving us a 4% absolute risk reduction. The number needed to treat in that case is 25 because we'd have to treat 25 people to avoid one bad outcome. That's the inverse of 4%. But what we really want to know is, is it worth taking the treatment? And we look at the NNT quite often to determine that. But what it doesn't tell us is the following things. How long did the treatment go on? How much of the treatment caused harm? That's the number needed to harm. How many people weren't going to have the bad outcome whether treated or not? Let's look at two hypothetical trials here. In trial number one, it ran for a week. There were a thousand people and they split it into two groups. Both groups had 500 people. There was a control group who got no treatment and all of them had a bad outcome. It doesn't matter what it was, it ingrown toenails, whatever. The treated group had 480 bad outcomes. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that 20 of the people were cured or, or avoided whatever the bad outcome was in one week. So this was a high risk group for whatever it is we're talking about. The NNT there was 25. For a treatment that's gonna last a week at such a high risk, maybe NNT of 25, it's worth giving it a try. At least 20 people will benefit and presumably with just a one week treatment, it's not gonna do a lot of harm. Well, let's consider trial number two. It runs for 10 years. Again, we have two groups of 500 people. The control group has 30 bad outcomes and the treated group has 10 bad outcomes. 20 bad events, bad outcomes were avoided out of 500 patients in the test group. The number needed to treat there is also 25, but this is very different. If you told me I was gonna be in a group of 500 people who were gonna be treated for 10 years and only one out of 25 of us was going to avoid the condition that we're trying to avoid, I might not think that's worth it. What the NNT of 25 doesn't show here, in the first case, in trial number one, there were no people who didn't have the bad outcome. In trial number two, in the control group, 470 people the overwhelming majority of them, 94% of them, didn't have the bad outcome. 6% of them did. In the treated group, it was 98% didn't have the bad outcome and 2% did. The number needed to treat in both these instances is exactly the same, but these are very different trials and very different treatment conditions. Another mistake I think we make, we have a tendency to be very cynical and exaggerate kickbacks. This is gonna to have to be a video that I will have to do some really deep research on. But I think we probably pin a little too much blame on individual doctors. Yes, they are enthralled by the pharmaceutical company reps. Maybe the donuts that the reps bring or the fancy food or the dinners that they bring them out to does have some impact on their prescribing habits. But if you think about it, if your doctor insists on a name brand statin, says you need to be on a statin and insists on a name brand one, well, you might want to be suspicious, especially given that all the major statins are currently off patent and there is at least a generic version of each of them. Now, if your doctor insists on a statin and offers a generic version, well, you may need to dig deeper, but current profit motive on the part of the doctor just seems to be less likely. I think the corruption comes more from the pharmaceutical companies than it does from individual doctors. I think it's unfair to automatically always assume that a doctor is corrupt. Some of them are undoubtedly just like any other profession. There are corrupt engineers, there are corrupt politicians, believe it or not. I'm sure there are corrupt lawyers, corrupt policemen, and there are perfectly honest people in all those professions and to taint them all with this kickback thing is unfair, 
without at least us digging a little deeper and trying to figure out what's really going on. And as guidance, if you are being prescribed a statin, the generic names and their brand name counterparts are given in this chart. Basically, if it ends in V-A-S-T-A-T-I-N or a bus statin with one or two syllables before it, it is a generic. And then of course the brand names correspond and if your doctor insists, no, you must take Lipitor. You're not allowed to take a Torvastatin. Either they are somehow getting something from the pharmaceutical companies or they don't trust generics for whatever reason, but I'd be highly suspicious in that situation. Now there is, in the United States at least, an anti-kickback statute. It's a criminal law that prohibits the knowing and willful payment of anything of value to induce or reward repa patient referrals or the generation of business involving any item or service, which would be, for example, a drug prescription. But here's the kicker, payable by the federal health care program. This particular law does not prohibit kickbacks, payments by pharmaceutical companies to doctors for prescribing if the federal government programs aren't paying for it. If private insurance is paying for it, this law doesn't cover it. Whether it's legal or not, well, I'll have to search around and see if there are other laws that cover that, but this law doesn't seem to cover that. However, pharmaceutical companies can legally engage in certain types of marketing practices. Okay, marketing practices cover everything, such as speaker fees, consulting fees, research funding, gifts and meals. That does go on all the time. They may not be legally beholden to the pharmaceutical company in that case, but you can imagine there is gonna be a strong motivation for them to stay in the good graces of the pharmaceutical company in those cases. That's actually allowed under this statute, which just amazes me. And then another kicker is that in the United States anyway, the Medicare system incentivizes the prescribing of statins. I did a video on that where I talk about this point system where institutions can get bonus payments from Medicare based solely on the number of statin prescriptions that patients are taking. Not what the results are, not whether there's actually an improvement on mortality or general health or even cholesterol levels for that matter, just the fact of taking prescriptions. So that to me negates this whole statute, at least when it comes to statins, and is bordering on unethical. In presenting these points today, I just want to make it clear that I am in no way changing my statin hesitant position, and that is for primary prevention, statins are wildly overprescribed and in many cases can actually do harm to people who shouldn't be anywhere near a statin. And that position becomes stronger the more I study it. Now there are some situations where their use could be appropriate. Some certain conditions of secondary prevention, highly oxidized LDL, familial hypercholesterolemia, unstable plaque, but they're being thoughtlessly overprescribed through misapplication of prostatin statistics, making the same mistakes I've just warned us against making, the unethical application of marketing techniques, and just the misapplication of general thought processes. My point is that this position, which most of my viewers hold that they're overprescribed, is strong enough on its own merits that we must carefully avoid straying from truth into rhetoric because that just opens us up to the problems that I talked about earlier. So I'd like to finish with this quote from John Abramson. It was in an editorial in MedPage today. It's from a much longer editorial that deserves its own video review, which maybe I'll do in the future. But I think this quote encapsulates what our response needs to be to the mainstream medical profession, which considers the matter resolved in favor of widespread use of statins. And he, he says it right here, calling an end to debate rarely serves the advancement of knowledge. And that's what's happening here. The mainstream medical profession wants to say the statin issue is resolved. Just take your statins, put them in the drinking water, give them to everybody over 40, give them to children, give them to people based on a certain LDL number. But we need to keep up the fight and play by the rules, even if the other side doesn't. So that's what I've got on this topic. If you appreciate this content, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on this or other topics that you'd like me to cover. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.